the Bacar dog is foiled to. I hope you had a good week. It's my pleasure to be with you again, to bring you God's word and to see what he has to say, not just in the pages of history, but to us today watching in 2020. So before we begin, let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of gathering in your name. Although circumstances are far from ideal, we give you glory that you have not abandoned your people, but that you continue to oversee us and to guide us and to shepherd us. We pray that you would open the meaning of your word to our hearts and minds today. May your own words be lifted up. May what I have to say be pleasing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This year we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. On August the 15th, 1945, the Japanese Empire officially surrendered on board the USS Missouri in the Pacific Ocean. And this came shortly after the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thus came to an end six bloody years, particularly including the brutal land, sea and air combat of the Pacific Theatre. But one soldier didn't get the message. Second Lieutenant Hiru Onoda had been sent to the Philippines the prior year and neither he nor the handful of soldiers under his command got word that the war was over. So they kept fighting. A few months later leaflets were left in the mountains where they were hiding and telling them that the war was over. But Anoda decided it was a trick. It was propaganda. Years later still, airplanes dropped photographs of the men's families, begging them, imploring them to put down their weapons and to stop fighting. But still, they kept on going. And finally, years later, on March the 11th, 1974, Anoda's wartime commanding officer tracked him down and persuaded him that the war was over and the gig was up. Almost 30 years after the bomb was dropped on Japan, Anoda finally gave up the fight. Despite warning after warning, invitation after invitation and event after event, Anoda refused to accept the reality of his state of existence. He ignored what was presented to him as compelling evidence. He was wasting his time, willing himself into a different reality, not believing that time was up. And that's basically the warning that Peter has for us in this passage today. Not to do with human affairs, not to do with war or peace. Peter's warning is for us to pay attention to the reality of what's happened before and what's going to happen in the future and to keep ourselves on the right path on the straight and narrow. There are two points that Peter makes and I'll cover both of them. The first one is that the world changes. The world changes. But the second one is God stays the same. The world changes, but God stays the same. So let's dive in, verses 1 and 2. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. When you read your Bible, pay attention to context. Look at the verses before and after the ones you're reading. Look at the chapters around the one you're reading. Look at anything else the author has written, and then you'll start to notice patterns, or common themes, or narratives, or concepts. For the last two weeks, Seth has been ably and helpfully guiding us through Peter's writings on false teachers, bad influences in the church, and temptations to fall away. And now we've moved into a different section, but it is not totally divorced from what we've learned in recent weeks. You see, after talking about false teachers, 
After talking about threats to the church and ways in which people can fall away off the path of righteousness, Peter says both of his letters have one big point. And that is, he wants to remind the church to be stimulated, other translations say to be stirred up, towards wholesome thinking. Stimulated or stirred up in the Greek has this idea of waking somebody up from a deep sleep, rousing someone from their slumber. The Greek Greek word used here for wholesome only occurs one other time in the entire Bible, and that's when Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, that his prayer is that God's people would remain pure, wholesome, unspoiled. It's the same message, he says, that the prophets from the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament, including himself, have been presenting for thousands of years. And the message is, wake up. Arouse yourself from your slumber. That's the point of what we're reading today. Now there's a huge amount you can draw out of this text. Things about how the universe came into existence. The biblical record of the passage of time. But as interesting as all those things are, and as important as it is to understand those things, that's not really Peter's main point. Peter is using those things as illustrations for his broader point. He's referring to those aspects of biblical history as ways to give illustration to what he wants to say, which is that we should be woken from our slumber and focused. Focused, as Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, on whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure. So these aren't cliff notes for a geology lecture. What this is, is a heartfelt plea for a spirit-led focus on the holiness of God. So there's a lot in here, but don't lose sight of the main point of what Peter is saying. And he's writing all this because apparently, look at verse 3 now, in the last days, There will be scoffers. Scoffers are people who mock. There will be scoffers, those who follow their own evil desires. So what are the last days? Well, we've been in them since Jesus rose from the grave. Don't think of the last days as just being the very end of time, the great tribulation, the Antichrist, the seven seals of judgment, the final destruction of Satan, all that kind of thing. The last days started. When crying out with his last breath and dying and laying in the tomb and on the third day the stone was rolled away and the Son of Man rose. Death was conquered, sin was defeated and the clock started ticking. Ticking down the years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes and seconds until Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. And pretty much from the time that he ascended, and from the time that the apostles started going out and spreading the gospel, preaching the gospel, people started mocking and saying things like this. He said he's coming back, so where is he? I don't see him anywhere. Why should I follow him? If he hasn't come back yet, he never will. Nothing looks different, does it? People still die, people still get sick, empires rise, empires fall, pandemics come and go, the same patterns, the same cycles, the same sort of events. It's all just the same, isn't it? No, it isn't. You see, the scoffers say, In verse 4, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Nothing ever changes, they say. History is cyclical, they say. It just keeps going and going and going and repeating the same things over and over again. But Peter says, look at it, that they deliberately forget. They willfully forget 
that at one point in time, there was nothing. Nothing. Just darkness. Void. Empty. Black. Nothingness. And then, let there be light. The first words of creation. There's the old joke about the scientist who challenges God to a creation contest. And the scientist reckons he can create a better human out of dirt than God did. Okay, God says, you're on, let's have a go. The scientist bends down to scoop up some material and God stops him and says, no, 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 use your own dirt. You see, friends, the universe was created, not manufactured out of something else, not something that evolved out of nothing. It was created. There was a time where there was nothing, and then there was a time where there was life. And that's not even a theological statement, it's a scientific one. Something can't just create itself out of nothing. It's a basic law of science. And yet the greatest scientific and mathematical mind of the 20th and 21st centuries, Professor Stephen Hawking, went to his grave believing this, quote, I think the universe was spontaneously created out of nothing, according to the laws of science. He held to the belief that the universe was suddenly and violently self-created, when an ultra-dense singularity, which is smaller than an atom, exploded, and the rest, as they say, is history. That's supposed to be scientific? The universe came into being out of nothing, even though something existed out of which it came into being? Do you hear how absurd that sounds? That there was nothing, but there was something, and therefore the universe was created out of something which was really nothing? It's madness. He's right in one way. The universe was created out of nothing because there is a creator. There was just nothing, infinite nothing, and then all of life was created by him who alone had the power to create it. He created the heavens. He created the earth. He created the sea. He separated one from the other. And then years later, look at verse 6. By these waters which he created, by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. There humanity was. Just going on living. Forgetting about God. Forgetting about his laws. Forgetting about his holiness. Just going on living in whatever way they wanted to live. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 this is a stunning statement. Genesis 6 verse 5 says that God saw the inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Does that sound familiar? Look back at verse 3. Scoffers will come who mock the idea that Jesus will return, who say they don't have any reason to get ready for his return, and they just follow their own evil desires. It's the same thing. And that's what people were doing in Genesis 6. Like Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, their God was their belly. Their mind was set only on earthly things, focused only on what pleased them, on what they wanted to do, forgetting completely about God. And then this old fella started building a ship. And people mocked him. What are you building that for, Noah? Nothing's going to happen. Life is good. Come on, Noah. Live your best life now. And then animals started walking and crawling and slithering into the ship, and still people didn't get it. We joke in our family that animals love me so much that if Seneca goes first and I'm left here, that scores of cats will just start to show up at the house to comfort me and to console me. And that's weird enough, but imagine seeing two elephants, two crocodiles, two sheep, and two raccoons all walking side by side up to this massive wooden ship which is miles away from any ocean. Wouldn't you assume 
something big was going to happen. And then one day, it started to rain. Violent, torrential, apocalyptic rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And the entire creation, everything that wasn't inside the ark, drowned. They just assumed everything was going to keep going the way it always had. Things come and things go. It's all just one big cycle that never really changes, so just get on with enjoying life and living it the way you want it to. Because life is for living, right? Well, actually, for most of the planet, life was for dying. You see, friends, two cataclysmic events. Creation and flood. Everything brought into existence by a word from God and everything blotted out by that same word. Nothing stays the same forever, is Peter's point. All of this, all our existence, is subject to change at a moment's notice. The world changes. Is any of this resonating with you? I hope it is. It's something that struck me personally in a very big way recently. Nothing specific, just generally speaking. And I'd urge you to consider the fact that your entire existence, your whole world, can change at any time just like that. You won't always be in perfect health. Your job won't always be there. You won't always have just the right amount of money in your bank account. Your friendships won't always last forever, and people won't always think of you in the same way that they do now. So friends, don't put any stock in those things. Don't spend your lives consumed thinking about being liked, or comfortable, or healthy, or wealthy. As the Lord himself said, don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths destroy and thieves break in and steal. Because as Peter says in verse 7, take a look, by the same word that all this was created, with a word, all of this will be destroyed. God's promise to Noah will hold. He will never again destroy the world by flood. The next time, he'll do it with fire. The world changes. With one seismic event, he created it. With another, he reversed it. And with another, he'll destroy it. But the greatest seismic event of all wasn't creation. It wasn't the flood. It was that day when the sky turned black. God's own son, blood pouring from the open wounds in his body. We who pollute this world with sin, that sin piled upon the shoulders of the spotless lamb, and with his final breath, redemption. Seismic. Everything changed. Whatever happened before, whatever you've done, all has changed. God's wrath passes over you if you look to that cross, if you look to that seismic event, if you confess your sins and follow Jesus. One day to the Lord, Peter writes, is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Don't make the mistake of thinking all this lasts forever. God's timing is his timing. The world changes. But, and this is our final point, God stays the same. He never changes. Look at verses 11 and 12. Look at the question Peter asks. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives 
as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. This is the big implication. Nothing stays the same forever except God. Hebrews tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, I am the Lord, I do not change. And Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. And because God never changes, because he stays the same, he's always holy. He's always been friends and always will be totally set apart from sin. He makes his dwelling where there is no sin and no sin can abide with him. That's why he sent his son to cover the sins of his people so that we could live with him forever where there is no sin, where there is just holiness. But don't make the mistake of thinking that your simple profession of faith by itself does anything for you. You know what I mean? Don't make the mistake that saying you're a Christian means you get to be with God when you leave this earth. Saying you're a Christian is simply a claim. It's giving voice to what's inside your mind, what's inside your heart. But the proof is in the fruit of your life. And it's worth it, every once in a while, myself included, to stop and ask ourselves, where am I with the Lord? I don't know about you, but it seems to me that it's a lot easier to practice churchianity than Christianity. You know what I mean? You ever think about that? Churchianity versus Christianity? The idea that it's a lot easier to identify as being part of a group, to commit to an organization, to put on the label. It's a lot easier to do any of those things any day of the week than it is to actually take up your cross and follow Jesus. So maybe think about things like this. Is your confidence, is your assurance based on an experience in your life rather than on Christ himself? So getting baptized, saying a prayer, a particular moment in your life, something like that. Are you putting stock in that event or that experience rather than Christ himself? Are you the first one to point out how the church is doing something wrong on Sunday morning, but you're the last one to take a look at what's in your own heart? Are you more inclined to gnash your teeth about abortion or COVID restrictions than you are to tear your garments over your own sin? Friends, I'm not trying to make you doubt. I'm not trying to talk down to you. I'm not trying to beat you up, but it would be incredibly irresponsible of me as one of your elders to take this platform where I can open up the word of God and show you what it has to say and then do anything other than to beg you to prove yourselves, to make every effort to present yourselves as someone approved to God. Because he doesn't change. He's always the same. Because friends, look at the end of verse 12 and into 13. Even though all this will be destroyed by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. And even though we do speed this coming, we long for the day where sin is eradicated from the face of the earth. And there's no more death and there's no more pain and there's no more suffering. We will only share in that glory if we truly belong to Jesus Christ. I'm tired of 2020. I'm tired of restrictions. 
I'm tired of not seeing my friends. I'm tired of people getting sick and dying from a virus that just came out of nowhere. I'm tired of political infighting. I'm tired of lies. I'm tired of war. I'm tired of pain. I'm tired of suffering. And I'm tired of death. But I know it will all end. I know this won't last forever. Because I know that nothing stays the same. I know that like a thief in the night, the day of the Lord will come. Just as Jesus said, people will be going about their daily business, working in the fields, taking care of their families, getting on with their lives, and it'll come. But I don't look forward to it, because I deserve it. I don't. None of us do. I look forward to it, because I look forward to standing at the throne and then falling to my knees because all I want is Jesus. It's why we sing hymns like this one, wealth and honour I disdain, earthly comforts all are vain, these can never satisfy, give me Christ or else I die. Let's make that our battle cry. When we start to think we deserve what we have. When we start to think anything we do carries any weight with God. When we start to think that we have any reason to put confidence in the flesh. Let's examine our hearts. Let's call on Jesus. Call on him who was there. When he said, let there be light. On him who was prophesied about as the coming Messiah, the suffering servant. The one who died to give us life, the one who was broken to make us whole, and the one who became a servant so that we might dwell with the King. The world changes. God stays the same. Now to him who was able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us recall to our minds only that which gives you glory and which is good for building up one another. I thank you, Father, that you have given us your servant, Peter, who reminds us in the text we looked at today that even though people may think this all goes on forever with no change, that it will change and it does change and it has changed. So help us to remember not to become sedentary or set in our ways, focused only on the here and now, focused only on how we can fill our bellies, focused only on what we can get out of life. But help us to focus on you, Lord. Help us to look to the cross in all we do, to live lives that are guided by the very simple principle that we want to live in the same way your son did, humble and meek and mild and loving and merciful and gracious and compassionate. Help us to truly be your church, Lord, not a club or not an organization, but to be your people who are born again and called out of darkness into the light, to shine that light in the world around us that desperately needs to hear the message of your gospel. So help us in the days ahead, at work, at home, at school, wherever we go. We pray that you would give us strength, you would give us wisdom, you would give us holiness, that you would help us to shine that light of the gospel to this world around us, to our friends, our family, our neighbours, our colleagues and everybody we meet. Be with us, Lord. Thank you for all you've done for us. 
Help us to never take it for granted, but to always give you the glory. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.